Okay, I think that is good. So again, for the recording, uh, this is the first of many share community development calls and we're doing a brief round of introductions before we get into details. All right, so sorry, Jeff, were you done there? All right, so Judy, you're next on the list. Hi, this is Judy Rutenberg from the Association of Research Libraries, um, and I'm here on this call uh, really to listen um, to, to all of you. I'm really thrilled to see so many of you on the call um, and to uh, listen sort of keenly for how um, ARL can continue to support this community. All right, going down the list. Cam, you're, you're next on the list. Uh, hey guys, my name is Cam. I've been working with Jeff uh, at 221B for about I guess, six months now. Uh, and open access is something I'm really passionate about and I'm really excited to be working on this project. And then Ryan's next. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Ryan Mason. Um, same thing as uh, Cam that I'm working with Jeff at 221B. I'm a software engineer and um, I got involved with Share through COS. All right, then uh, David, I, I thought I saw you on the list as well. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, David Miner from UC San Diego, where I work in the library and run our data, research data curation program. And we spent a large chunk of 2016-17 working with Share, building a local dashboard, a portal, if you will, uh, to access kind of our campus-based information that was in Share. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Uh, Drew Wuxia from Virginia Tech. Uh, I've been involved in Share on and off uh, from the beginning uh, till now. Uh, 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 some involvement, but not not very heavily. And uh, we are uh, happy to contribute more from now. And I also have Ilin Chen here. Uh, you probably introduced yourself, and I think. <laughs> Uh, uh, Cyrus Wong is joining us online. I'm not sure, but if he is, he will uh, introduce himself after Inlin. So let's move on to Inlin. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yilin Chen. Uh, I work with uh, Zhu uh, in the University of Virginia Tech. Yeah. Okay, Cyrus on there? Well, no, then let's move on to the next one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, Cyrus oh. here. Yeah, I'm here. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, this is Xin Yue. I'm a PhD student uh, in Virginia Tech. So I, I work with uh, Ji Wu uh, in, the, in relative uh, digital library projects. So I'm interested in the shared project to see what I can contribute. Excellent. Let's keep going down the list. Thank you, Matt. Harp, you're the next on the list, and then it, it probably makes sense for others that uh, similar location to, to pipe in as well. Hi, I'm Matt Harp, a research data librarian here at Arizona State University. I'm also uh, one of the shared curation associates. I'm also working on the NEH grant as a visiting program officer for ARL, um, and ASU has a lot of interest in what's happening with SHARE, the future of SHARE, and potential collaborations. And I'm actually sending a link to one of our AULs, Deborah Kurtz, so she can join the call. Great. Yeah, I, th I thought I saw Deborah in the, in the Discord channel, but... And yeah, there was there were some issues on her end, but I'm sending uh, her the link now. So. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Hey, y'all. Hey, this is Anna Kraft at UNC Greensboro, and I represent the NC Docs, a collaborative institutional repository that's based at UNCG, and we have um, right now nine schools. We're potentially growing, and there's interest in that group in working more with discovery through share and contributing material. So I'm here to represent that group. Great. Um, hi, this is Allison. There's a bunch of us here from University of Minnesota Libraries. Lisa Johnson has been involved with share in the past, but the rest of us are just hoping to learn more. Awesome. Hello. Damien Caps uh, from Villanova with the whole technology team. Uh, we know absolutely nothing about Share, and we are hoping to remedy that today. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, 
Um, this is Lauren DeMonte from the University of Rochester. I'm the Director of Research Initiatives at the Library. I'm going to learn more, figure out how we can get involved. Great. Hi, I'm Sherry Lake. I'm the scholarly repository librarian at the University of Virginia. I was too one of the SHARE curation associates and I'm very interested in the next phase of SHARE. So, thanks. Curtis Thacker from Brigham Young University is here to learn more. Hey, welcome. Hi, Chris Colin from, um, I'm the data curation librarian from the University of Arizona and also manage our um, data management services. And I'm interested to learn more about how we might be able to, um, to work with SHARE. Excellent. And yeah. then Leo, I think you're last on the yes. official list here. Hello, I, uh, all. Um, my name is Leo Mack. I work for JISC in the UK. If I sense it correctly, I might even be the only person who is not on the American continent. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I work for JISC on um, partly on one um, big EU funded project, which is Open Air, and more specifically Open Air Connect. Um, and I'm yeah mostly here to learn about share, learn a bit about sort of I guess development aspirations, what the type of collaborators are, um, and maybe also ask some questions about sort of business development or um, business model development. Um, and then, yeah, just get a sense for where collaboration opportunities are. I think Deborah, I saw that you joined. Hi. Uh, welcome. We're just doing brief introductions here. Okay. Deborah Hankin Kurtz, Arizona State University Library. Um, I'm new to the role here at the libraries, but familiar with the work at SHARE through other previous roles and looking forward to, to working with everybody kind of in new contexts. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anyone that we missed? Okay. Sounds like we pretty much got it covered. Welcome all. So. So we have a great group here, and it's very exciting to have you all here. Uh, I, th I think our, our plan here is to stay pretty informal uh, for this first call. Uh, so we, so I'm looking, hopefully you can all see uh, the agenda and the screen sharing here. Maybe zoom in a little bit of that. Oh, it won't let me, will it? Uh, how do I zoom through the menu? I'm too used to the quick keys, and it won't let me do that. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So, so essentially we just got acquainted, obviously. Um, and then the plan is just to outline the, the current direction where the activity has been, current progress, and then really just talking about uh, getting organized, uh, ways we see uh, folks contributing, participating in the near future and, and, and longer term as well. And then really thinking about uh, the frequency of, of these calls as well. Uh, so there is a link in the agenda there that goes to this other document that I figured we would start from. And uh, the plan here is for uh, Jeff and I to kind of outline a little bit of the current direction and activity. But the, this, this document is what we've been working on. Uh, I just went to the share red uh, specs that is essentially uh, a more detailed view in terms of what I what what Jeff and I will talk through quickly here, uh, but you can skim through it and look at all the various aspects of this. Uh, but I think really the best place to start is this diagram here. Oh, and oh, and Jeff, you added a lot of new stuff, didn't you? Or someone did? It's re real time updates here. So let's see. So the the Jeff, would it would it make sense to kind of talk through the the ideas around uh, Node Red and Share Red, then kind of within the larger context? Yeah, I, I think that yeah, uh, maybe we should start with just a little bit of the larger context, and then yep. back into the the Share Red. Yeah, sounds good. So, so so within Share, uh, one of the things that that were that were in progress is a a shift from being a highly centralized 
support and development as well as infrastructure model to being more distributed uh, in infrastructure as well as people support participation etc so really uh, top to bottom in that regard and, and and the to what degree each of those is distributed versus centralized is something that is still in progress uh, but the the basic idea is to have the actual processing of metadata that may be coming in to share, uh, the indexing, the sharing of data, the development, the building of tools on top of it, where those tools may be running to have that be kind of distributed throughout the community. Uh, and I have a question from David about, are the notes supposed to be collaboratively worked on? Yes, please, please do. Uh, so, and, and anyone that is, that is, that is a good point that we haven't designated a note taker, have we? Uh, I think it probably makes sense at this point for anyone to add notes as they can, but, but that's probably a good logistical point for future calls to designate a note taker. Uh, so, so within that, um, the, get back to my train of thought here. Um, so with things being distributed, uh, what we're working on now is kind of the first version of an architecture to be distributed and thinking that uh, knowing that not every institution or organization that would be involved with share would necessarily be standing up infrastructure. One of the things we have in mind is that there may be some points in the community that are able to take a slightly heavier load than others that like so so for example uh be able to accept jobs and run those for those for different institutions but but really the one of the big focuses here is to shift from a, a highly centralized or national regional geographical regional view to also really enable more of a a local institutional view so so i think what uh what David Miner alluded to a little bit earlier about the dashboard that was created for them. That was a dashboard that was looking at the, the total share uh, corpus data set in total, but really filtering down to what is most important from their standpoint from, from looking at a UC San Diego uh, lens. So, so taking a step back and thinking about that, what we, what we can then look to replicate for others to do, not necessarily with the same kind of thing with a dashboard necessarily, but but looking at the kind of information that that is pulled together, taking a look at that from an institutional context, but then also making that available to share to others and and to potentially. So if, for example, if at Notre Dame we harvested some records that are relevant to UC San Diego, or vice versa, that very easy to also share those, index them, link them, et cetera, and then continue to build uh, things on top of it. And, and, and also knowing that share is not the only type of tool or system or communities work on this, that you're really thinking about how we can also start to bridge some of those uh, community uh, boundaries as well. Um, so that, I think that's, that's kind of a rough like strategic overview. Um, any questions initially on that? Okay, so I'll take silence is nothing yet. Um, so, so now, let me zoom out a little bit so this is a little easier to see. There we go. Just, just one word, one word sure. a, a bit of a uh, little commentary. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about um, uh, where, we, where we were in this last phase of share, we were we were uh, collecting metadata, uh, harvesting metadata from uh, many sources uh, in the, uh, the hopes to, to aggregate that, um, uh, normalize it, uh, and make it available uh, for the creation of new services on, on top of this, this knowledge. Um, that is a, that's, that in a centralized system is a very big task. It's a big ask um, because, uh, and I think everyone on the call is probably very well aware, uh, metadata at best is inconsistent. 
uh, in its quality. Um, uh, and that's, that's a, a problem that not just technology will solve, but, but humans need to, need to be involved in. Um, and that metadata is awfully locally relevant. Um, it's locally relevant to, for example, the institution that is providing that metadata, for example, on their repository. Um, uh, in the same way that the data, the information that we'd use as input is relevant, what we want from that data is also locally relevant to that institution. So um, uh, UCSD, when we built the, the dashboard for them, Triton Share, uh, using on, on top of uh, uh, this share data, this data from many different places and then displayed on this dashboard, um, uh, they had a problem they wanted to solve for UCSD. Um, uh, and from a, from a scaling standpoint, this is where, this is exactly what we need to be doing is solving these local problems um, uh, and engaging local experts to be able to help solve those. And so this is why this de decentralized approach is so important because uh, uh, it just, it, it doesn't make sense uh, for, for one group to be able to solve everybody's problems. You have data you can't share publicly, uh, that you have uh, private to your institution that you want to do something with, uh, and that may be connected to some things that Rick wants to do at Notre Dame and, and others want to do um, uh, other places, um, uh, but there are local problems you want to solve, uh, and you need to be able to solve those in the way that you need to be able to solve them. Uh, that seems like it's an obvious statement, but uh, uh, we need to create this virtuous cycle if we want people to be able to contribute to this, this you know, uh, uh, large aggregated data set, they need to solve their own problems first. You need to be somewhat selfish in that. Um, and so that's, that, that is the, the impetus for really pushing this decentralized um, uh, model now in this phase. Um, is that there needs to be this institutional ownership because those are the problems. The, the product owners are the, in this case, uh, in many cases, the institution. Uh, and so what you're going to be hearing about, and as uh, Rick will, will tell you about next, is, is technologies that really allow us to better engage the people that are closest to both the problem and or the original data that will solve those problems. Uh, and, and this is this is critical because the bigger problems that we want to solve when all of this data could be you know put together and combined with private data and all of these things these are this is this is game changing stuff this is these knowledge discovery systems where someone just goes to a terminal and says tell me how malaria and intestinal disease are related in ways that I've never thought of before and then just some you know information pops up that is this is powered by this metadata but that ignores all of this curation and local expertise and local problems in combination with uh, private data and all of these other things that, that have to be solved in a, in a, owned, in a locally owned manner. And so that's, that is, that is uh, for the people that are just new to share, new to, new to this phase especially, uh, that is uh, what is uh, behind all of this, this next uh, piece of the conversation. Great, great. Yeah, so, and, and so, and, and, and part of how we have really approached this is in thinking about, uh, you know, having the now experience of the three plus years of existing share and how things, ha how the support has been executed with Center for Open Science as, as the primary uh, holder of that, service provider for that, and then moving to this other broader model, you know, part of that is how we get the data in and how we also put the control of how that works, how that happens more in the community's hands is a big part of it. So we, we the, with Center for Open Science, it was, it was a, a big, we do it for you model. And we're looking to, to work to more of an enabling facilitation model with this. And a part of that is then thinking, well, how can we make it as easy as possible to configure and set up and, and hide some of the complexities that are not going to vary uh, from institution to institution, et cetera. So that's a, a big part of the thinking behind this. And, and I, think, uh, it, I think it makes sense to show a very simple example of how we do this before the more complex example that, that, uh, that I think Cam may be able to, to show as, as, we, as we progress here. But the, but the basic idea here, so we have, we, we're working within this uh, framework called Node-RED. And what it is, is it, it is a way to set up 
a workflow with kind of some set operations that you don't have to define yourself. So, so making a web request, uh, taking that response, and then starting to parse that. So this is a very simple example here. So something that we've been just toying with the different ideas of different destinations, different sources, et cetera. So this is one, this example is looking at going to Crossref. So, so this very simple example, just defining the URL. So saying I'm going to grab works from Crossref and then it's going to pass that URL to a web request. And this is actually just a standard HTTP request that Node-RED is, is, does for you already. And then this is just saying, I'm going to select the things coming from there and then parse those through. So it's actually a very simple thing. So this is a, an example of a flow that can then get, get items from Crossref. And, and at the moment, this, this is very kind of low level uh, look into things. But essentially, this is the web request, the contents of the web request that came back. And then if I start to dive in, I can start to see some of the records coming in here. Uh, so, so like this is an example of a record uh, that a book chapter, for example. So, so there's, there's a whole series of records. And obviously, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the kind of data that we would harvest from a place like Crossref. But, it, but it's a, this is really just meant to be kind of a simple example of the idea here where if I go back to the diagram now, so the idea that, that really for any source that we want to pull data from, define a workflow that pulls that in, defines the schema, defines any, any thing configuration. So what URL does it need to request from, et cetera? What, what kind of endpoint is it? Is it OAIPMH? Is it going to accept REST-based requests? And then once the data comes back, com comes back how do we want to map that? So, so then, when I'm pulling through this record and then pulling together uh, data from say, you know, 10 or 15 different sources, you want to be able to map that to something fairly common in order to use it uh, in total. So, so the idea here then is that you kind of, we're, we're thinking you would define this flow and then uh, having a, a message queue that those, those jobs would be able to submit to. So I define a flow and say, okay, I want to run this and then, get the data back and then do the mapping and persist it to our, our, our layer. So, so, in, so in this example, uh, Elasticsearch. So the, the whole idea here is that we think you have Node-RED is very much a way where it would be editing, configuring, and then also then having kind of a, 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 an environment that is not necessarily the same as where you're setting up these flows. It, the, what I just showed with Node-RED uh, and, and I can give a little bit of background to that in a, simple, in a second of what Node-RED actually is. Um, but essentially, this, this is something that is, is a really nice community-based tool that we didn't create that we realized was something that would be incredibly useful to, to simplify uh, how things are configured within this. But, but really also looking to, to add more of a, a, a more shared infrastructure that, that folks can use. So, so again, one, one of the things I talked about earlier about how uh, we're not necessarily assuming that every institution will actually be running these queues, but the idea here is that we, could, we, we have uh, some shared community sites that, that are able to do what they can to help with the community that can accept those. So, so Notre Dame being one example of that, that we've thought of as, as an instance within this kind of network of providers, but really not looking to uh, dictate that it has to be a set number, it has to be an order name you submit things to, et cetera, right? But really just like as, as one place that could do some of that and then to kind of be that one of those service providers. Now, of course, we haven't fully explored, explored what our overall capacity would be to accept those kinds of the volume and things like that. So those are all things that we're going to be uh, figuring out uh, as we go. Jeff, did you have anything else to, to add to that? Yeah, so this could be something we discuss and, and I'd, I'd be curious to know, uh, so, so this, this, I'd be curious to know uh, from uh, folks on the line um, if they've used tools like this before. So the idea here is, is um, 
you know, we're trying to, uh, in any problem that we're trying to solve in this shared context, we need to gather data first and, and then do something with it. Uh, and so this node red piece uh, uh, was our way of thinking about how do we, how do we engage that local expertise, but in as um, uh, uh, inclusive a manner as possible. And I think what we've learned uh, in the past is that uh, simply uh, um, expecting code to be developed uh, is not going to get the community engagement that we want, and especially the uh, diversity of expertise and individuals that, that we want um, I, I, to be contributing to these to these to, to this problem solving effort. Uh, and so, what Node Red is is an example of what's called a flow based programming uh, environment, um, uh, where uh, you literally drag and drop different functions, different uh, tasks into the environment and then connect the inputs and outputs of those tasks together in order to create these more complex flows. So uh, what, Rick had, uh, what Rick took you through was sort of going to the, you know, a certain API, uh, asking for that data, doing something with some of those fields, uh, uh, and then transforming that into um, uh, you know, this next uh, uh, schema-based persistence. And so all we're doing is, is gathering the data and then doing some basic normalization against what that data, what we think that data uh, is supposed to look like. Um, uh, but you can do that without touching any code. Uh, and the more people contribute it, the less code that's required. So at some point, while well, right now uh, hitting Crossref and maybe making a, a RESTful request to an API and this, these, these words may not be super familiar to you and that's fine, uh, but someone who, for whom that is familiar could wrap that all up and say, okay, just we're, we're gonna drag the Crossref function into the environment and that's going to then generate some data with this uh, certain schema. And so now they've encapsulated that, that uh, logic into this uh, another level abstraction that someone then may be able to work with. They may be able to say, okay, I don't know a lot about requests and APIs, but I do know that if I, if I uh, uh, drag this cross-ref function on and I say I want the, this type of data, so I want data sets and, and uh, preprints from cross-ref um, uh, or, or preprints with data sets, for example, I know how to make that query, so I do that and then I, I want data from archive and I want to combine those in a certain way, uh, that then becomes, I think, much more accessible. And this is what flow-based program has demonstrated in the IoT community, uh, the Internet of Things community, the home automation community. That's where Node Red comes from. Uh, our fork of it is we're, we're uh, right now calling it Share Red. Uh, but this was one of the ideas to really lower the barrier of entry, access more expertise in the local environment in order to decentralize and distribute um, uh, the potential to solve these bigger problems. So um, uh, one, does anybody have experience with tools like this? Uh, uh, two, uh, uh, just from what you've seen, uh, uh, does this seem like uh, an approach that might uh, uh, include more people to solving these local efforts? And then if, if, if there's still questions here, we can even run through a, a more detailed example. I think Ryan has uh, an example that we can, we can share with, with the team. Um, so those two things I, I'd like to hear more from the community about. So one, anybody have experience with tools like this? Hi, uh, this is Ji Wu from Virginia Tech. Uh, this looks awfully like uh, Yahoo Pipes that's been released like 10 years ago. I wonder if this is a similar uh, concept yeah, it's very, very similar. Yahoo Pipes was, was a flow-based uh, environment. Uh, flow-based programming never picked up a lot of steam, but Yahoo Pipes is a good example of, of where it was successful for certain domains. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, that, that's pretty much exactly what it is. Uh, Node Red is a um, open source community developed version of that with a little bit of a higher abstraction to do just about anything. Um, rather than dealing just with data, uh, it does pretty much any function that you can imagine because it's just, it's really, it's flow-based programming. It's, it's the, the programming is the level of abstraction. They're not working with data like in pipes. Um, and so you can, you can write functions for anything and have it do anything. You can have it talk to Alexa and turn on your lights. Uh, if you, you know, if, if a camera detects your car in the garage, whatever you want, it, it can do. Um, uh, and that's how it's being used now. 
but we can take the, that same mentality. And there's a lot of these predefined functions from the community that deal with data. And so we have a lot of the pipes functionality already built in and anything we don't, it's quite trivial to add. In fact, we've, we're working right now on a OAI PMH uh, function. Uh, yeah. The uh, Internet of Things community doesn't need to tap too many OAI uh, resources, uh, but we do. And so we can just contribute that one small module and then benefit from everything else that community is doing. So yes, very similar to pipes, uh, and, but it has, that general, it has that generalizability that I think we will benefit from as we expand the community who is, uh, has uh, concerns in this, in this domain. Good. Uh, one other question is about, uh, uh, this looks like me uh, to be mainly about data source. Uh, so are we thinking about uh, pull the data together uh, when they're going out of the system or each uh, distributed um, institution will have their own data sync? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, uh, Rick touched on it uh, in by saying Notre Dame could be one of the hosts of some of this data. Uh, and that'll be a decision that everyone will, will need to make for themselves. Uh, we want to assume that uh, in, in, I think, developing the technology, assume that um, uh, people could just use this for their own purposes and not share it with anybody. And so we want to build it in such a way that um, I, I um, if, if uh, University of Virginia, for example, uh, uh, wanted to gather from five different sources, combine them in a certain way, and do that on a regular basis. Every day, ask if there's new data from those five sources, and then generate a dashboard based on that data. They could do that without worrying what everybody else is concerned with, what everybody else is doing. And we would develop technologies as long as they're aligned with enough of the community that would help them do that. And this interface here for gathering seems to be one of the places that does have enough commonality that's worth putting some effort as a community to make really easy uh, and uh, extremely functional for these use cases. Now, if everybody's hitting you know, archive and bioarchive by themselves, that, that's somewhat of a wasted resource. Uh, perhaps there should be you know, a few groups that say, okay, yeah, we're, we're gonna be doing this at scale. We have the resources. We're going to uh, collect these, these 10 um, uh, uh, resources and normalize them in this way and make that available. That's the sort of next piece of this where um, uh, those groups can do that. And we, we, are, uh, and we want to think about, uh, and I, we have some ideas using some, uh, uh, some of the more uh, uh, to modern thinking about decentralization um, uh, from you know, torrents and, and uh, dare I say blockchain, um, and I mean that very, very lightly, uh, 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 that can sort of basically announce to the world, okay, Notre Dame is, is, is harvesting from these 100 sources. And so if you would prefer just to gather data from them rather than asking the source for all that raw information, you could, you could find out very quickly that, oh, Notre Dame gathers cross-ref data every day. They've done this normalization. I might as well hit their cache rather than hitting cross-ref uh, myself. And so we lower cross-ref's burden uh, and, and, and we, we maximize the fact that Notre Dame is, is willing to host this information in this way. And so that's this next piece that, that would become after the gathering phase um, uh, that we would be, we'd be thinking about. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, yep. One more question, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so is the existing uh, shared project to data, uh, would, that, would, would the shared project consider making them a data source? Yeah, we could make that a data source. There's different ways to handle the data that currently exists. Um, uh, and it really, is gonna, this is gonna depend on the use cases that we want to uh, be working on. Uh, uh, I, we, we need to be very uh, outcome focused. We really need to deal with the problems that you're concerned with. We're only going to get contribution from the community if we're dealing with concerns that you have. Uh, um, uh, so, you know, instead of if, sort of an if you build it, they will come sort of approach. Well, what is the problem that you need to solve? And let's solve that problem and, and see how it's aligned with this. So with, with that in mind, we would then want to look at what's existing and share and say in, in sort of this former uh, uh, phase of share and say, well, does that normalized format benefit us to these problems that we're going to solve now? 
Um, uh, or do we need to do we need to, to tweak that? Do we need to combine that with private data that can't be shared publicly? Whatever those whatever those uh, uh, issues are, uh, but that that would be the right approach where we could then just make that a source, just just like you said. And so we, we have a we have a, a nice migration path here because of that. Um, I, I guess uh, uh, parsimony uh, uh, in in how we approach the the eventual uh, uh, problem that we're dealing with. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and just to add on that, one of the things we've, we've thought of is, is the, a lot of the work that Center for Open Science has done with preprint services and things like that also seem like a natural one that could potentially be, you know, one community source of data where, where they're handling a portion of the responsibility, but it's not then on everyone to, do, to duplicate that. And, and, and in terms of the questions about, so, so, so far we've just talked about okay, getting the data in, and as Jeff has, has said, it's, it's, that's, this is really a means to the end of looking to solve local problems. So, so what I've pulled up here is just one example of the one that we have with you know, creating a dashboard on top of the data. So pulling it in, so, so for example, uh, at Notre Dame, uh, we're very much keen on taking what UC San Diego has done for the dashboard, but then changing and tailoring that to concerns at Notre Dame and also the sources coming in and thinking about, like as Jeff alluded to, you know, maybe bringing in some data that we license from Web of Science, for example. So we want to be able to incorporate that data that we may or may not be able to share, but we want to incorporate that to get a, a, as, as comprehensive a view that we can of what's happening uh, at Notre Dame and then also incorporate uh, other sources as well. Um, and then by doing so, we then are, have a lot more power to get that, that aspect where we can look at both what is the data we have openly available as what, and also the data that we're licensing as well. Like I, I think the, in, in the end, we all want data to be as open as possible and, and we continue to strive for that. And we also want to get access to other, other aspects and, and there may be private data that is only, that we only want to have available at the institution if we're bringing these to uh, executive level leaders within the university, et cetera, right? So, so there, there's other concerns uh, to, to incorporate like that. Uh, so, so but, but it doesn't have to be as like large <laughs> use case as these either. It could be, it could be very small, like small, smaller in terms of, uh, you know, like uh, organizational exposure or, or scope. It doesn't have to be something that is so like widely university reaching it could be uh, something that could just be helping feed into a particular system or repository it could be something that then feeds into your own search or helping do analysis for a particular research project. We really don't want to limit the thinking on this in terms of the, the level of scope that, that we would expect it to be used. So, I think uh, it may make sense. I'm just looking, scanning through this, this more detailed document to see if there's anything else to mention. Uh, one thing to mention is, so you'll notice within uh, the Sherwood document, there's a section called Statement of Work, and, and those are the immediate high-level priorities that we have. So we've already been talking a lot about reharvesting the, or re-architecting the harvesting framework with focus on community contribution. There is a graph database focus to this as well once we've received the data to persist that and link it. Uh, and then once it is there to expose it, uh, really this metadata editing pipeline, we've talked a little bit about how we want the mappings to be more easily configurable in tools like Node-RED, uh, but really doing, really moving beyond that is the scope and is the intention of this. Uh, so now, I don't know if, it, if there aren't other immediate, are there other immediate questions? Rick, I, I have a question. This is David sure. Miner. Um, is there still uh, some kind of a concept that uh, there is a share, sorry, I did scare quotes, you can't see that, a share uh, corpus of data sitting somewhere that is being harvested and collected, or is it, or is it really moving to a purely distributed, there's a whole bunch of different pots of share data sitting out there? I think the, 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 in the, the 
the philosophy and intent is the is the ladder of multiple pots. That said, Share as exists today continues to harvest data. Uh, being hosted at the Center for Open Science, we we are looking to uh, move some of that hosting to Notre Dame and Virginia Tech is also a a site for that as well. Uh, but really. We don't want it to end there. The, the goal is not for Notre Dame and Virginia Tech to be kind of the primary hosts of SHARE. It's really meant to be more of that distributed model. Uh, but, but again, kind of based on organizational capacity and what we each agree to do in terms of uh, divide and conquer division of labor of, of being able to pull in the data, aggregate it, et cetera, you know, we, we wanna be pragmatic about that as well where we can kind of take ownership of this. It's kind of a, a model that I have thought of that as kind of similar to this in terms of how distributed is, is, is with locks, where different institutions, you know, agree to say, okay, I'm going to preserve this portion of the data. It's not going to be 100%, but then there's some analysis within the community of, of, of installations of, of instances of locks saying, well, let's make sure there's at least, you know, you know, three or four sites that are duplicating this data, right? So kind of that's the kind of mindset that that we have coming into this to think about how we can kind of work together as a community to make sure we have uh, things in a healthy state. There's a, just to get a little deeper on, on what decentralization really means. So in most, most of the time, especially in uh, these more modern contexts like blockchain, uh, uh, torrents, you're, you're talking about decentralization in environments where you don't have a lot of trust or you don't want to trust, uh, you want, certain guarantees uh, via the technology or certain levels of anonymization where trust isn't really an issue, uh, where enough people can hold things. Um, uh, we can capitalize on the fact that we still, we are an environment of, of trust to a certain degree. Um, uh, there's obviously use cases, especially, you know, for, for example, in, in some of the, the data rescue, data refuge uh, projects where we thought there, were, there was trust and, and it seems to be maybe a little less uh, uh, trustworthy. Um, uh, but still, for, for many use cases, there are, there are environments of trust. And, and so we just need to expand that a little bit to get the benefits of decentralization, which includes protections uh, like uh, uh, a, a resource becoming untrusted or less trustworthy. Uh, but still, uh, I know Rick, I know Notre Dame, uh, and if they tell me something, I can gauge some probability of that, okay, what they tell me will be, will be right. And so if I just have a few more players in there, Okay, now I have Notre Dame and I have Virginia Tech. Uh, my trust in both of them is very high, uh, uh, and together that that is is extremely high. Uh, and so we can this this is this sort of balanced decentralization where we don't need to go full fledged. We can't trust any single um, agent in the system, uh, but because we have this sort of whitelist, this 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 gr these groups that we know are are uh, are reputable in the in the ecosystem, um, we can create what sort of feels like a centralized environment from a tool standpoint. The benefits of centralization is that it's very easy to work with. It's an easy resource to, to access, typically from a, from a tool development uh, point of view. Uh, but we can create, because we have this element of trust, um, or because we can engage our users and ask them who you trust, um, we can create uh, sort of this hybrid, um, this abstraction against that decentralized framework that looks like a centralized framework, that just knows that if you've said that you trust Rick and you trust Virginia Tech, you trust Notre Dame, you trust Virginia Tech, now you can access those resources almost if they're, as if they're one uh, centralized resource um, uh, without them having to uh, uh, only one of those, those groups take on this, this entire burden. And we could do that for many resources. And we can put into place, again, protections that guarantee overlap in a certain way, such that if, if Rick were to go in an evil direction, um, uh, well, we can still fall, fall back on Virginia Tech uh, to, to host, you know, these pieces of, until the community can, can come up with a response to, to cover w what Rick was providing. And I, I don't think Rick will, will become evil, but just in case he does. Well, it's not just me. It's Notre Dame back in this. So. <laughs> the the, the Hesburgh Libraries here. So, yeah. There you go. Hesburgh Libraries. <laughs> High potential for evil. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so let's, so I think, uh, Cam, if there's something that, that, that makes sense for you to show at this point, that would be a quick, probably maybe a good uh, time to- so, Sorry, um, Leo here um, from TWISC. Sure. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, sorry to jump in. Um, I was just wondering. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering because it's quite interesting to hear um, sort of the approach you're taking uh, with Share Now because looking at it from the sort of European context, we I'm not I'm not sure how much you know about Open Air, um, but there's a, obviously kind of a system that is similar-ish um, in the well funded by the European Commission, which is under development, which is the so-called Open Air system, which takes a much more sort of centralised approach. And the thing I know about sort of Open Air is that um, despite this far more sort of centralized approach. Um, there is, or even, even sort of open air is struggling with kind of the, its, its own vision on it, on the sustainability of the system and the kind of, you could say, well, business organization model behind this. Um, do you have any thoughts on what your transition towards a system that is more decentralized would mean for your, well, well, I guess long-term sustainability and how how you organize the system or, well, business model might be wrong because there might not be much of a business behind it, but maybe your organization model is more appropriate, the more appropriate term. Yeah, Jeff, you, you, do you want to speak to that or? Yeah, I, I can comment on it and, and then, and then uh, uh, others can, can weigh in. Um, the business model changes uh, dramatically uh, uh, from one of a centralized service provider to uh, a community, uh, a distributed community effort, um, even with these decentralization uh, techniques that allow for it to look like it's, it's, it's a, a single service. Um, uh, and each of those uh, groups involved in, in that uh, community effort, you know, can have their own business models for how they approach this. Um, if, for example, they're solving very local concerns and decide, well, we, we use, we use uh, a Crossref a lot, so we might as well uh, just share that with the community. Caches are cheap to maintain, so we'll do this one thing, but we're really solving our local concerns. Then locally, they can solve that with, you know, say, internal funds. Um, uh, if another group says, well, really, you know, we want to focus on preprints. Preprints is a big deal right now. Uh, discovery is is uh, difficult because there's so many providers popping up. Uh, uh, we want to engage funders on that. They can pursue that business model and work on sustainability through those efforts. The benefits to the community uh, and, and the technologies that we're thinking about developing is that sometimes those business models don't work out. Uh, sometimes sustainability, we, we, we always talk about 10, 20, 100 years sustainability before we even prove a concept is, is going to uh, work. Um, well, if it doesn't work out, there's still the chance that if someone is using that or leveraging what that service provided uh, before, their, um, uh, before they you know, pivoted or, or, or went under or whatever the issue is, uh, they can gather that information very quickly and easily. And, and to the community, then there's a seamless transition. The protocols, the communication standards are all there so that we talk to each other in the same way. Uh, uh, and so Rick may be hosting it now, and then all of a sudden I host a little bit. Uh, Virginia Tech host comes on. They say, well, I can ho help host this. There's a, there's a way to deal with that. And that's, I think, the, uh, uh, that's this community model that, that you know, open source, for example, has demonstrated out that you can, there's many in the open source world, there are many, many uh, business models and sustainability plans that behind those, those approaches. But there's always this backup to the community that because there is some similarity in how we speak and how we license things, for example, we can fall back on those standards as a protection um, uh, in case one of those business models doesn't pan out the way that, that perhaps uh, we had intended to five or 100 years ago. Okay, and knowing that we have five minutes officially left a week, but I can go beyond this, but I wanted to make sure for folks that that cannot, that we can, one, I wanted to just touch upon quickly the last two bullets there before uh, giving Cam a chance to show a little bit of that. So, so in terms of the frequency of these calls, I think we're, we're, we're thinking at least monthly. Uh, if it makes sense to do it more frequently, we certainly can, especially as, as the, the activity gets more and more active. Uh, that at the at the moment, I would say the community participation is very organic, and but also really looking to be very open as well. Uh, so so we've you know we've started with Notre Dame and 221B, 
actively working together and really looking to broaden that as more and more partners are looking to solve these problems. Uh, that you know, this this call itself has been a has been a pretty large group, but not assuming that every call is going to be this large or needs to be this large necessarily. There may be different uh, people that come in and out of the conversation. Uh, but really in terms of getting organized around uh, next steps, one of the things I want to pull up, so I'm on the sharerecearch.org site, uh, the, just the, the announcement for this call itself, I wanted to point out uh, towards the bottom, there are links to where we have been working in GitHub, as well as within uh, Discord chat. Uh, so that's, if you're not familiar with Discord, it's like many other chat, it's a, you know, it looks a lot like Slack as well when you look at these. And, and so this is the channel that we're currently operating in. See some, some behind the scenes notes of kind of prepping for this call we had, but, but we've had a lot of uh, just the, the planning around this, just the initial development activity, uh, pinging back and forth. We've been relying a lot on this channel and, and, it, and it's open that really, uh, that anyone can join here. And then the GitHub space, this is share research and, and you'll see all of the activity uh, that's happening there. So, so share red and share red OAPMH, obviously the ones that have received the most activity uh, recently. So, that, so in, in terms of uh, tracking tasks for work, we have not necessarily designated JIRA or GitHub issues or anything like that as a primary place to do that. I think that can be a point of discussion for this group as we move forward. Um, but we definitely, as, as of course, as, as you add more and more people, the necessity for those kinds of tracking tools becomes more and more important. So, so we definitely recognize that. Um, so, so any questions, comments on that? I, I'd be curious uh, um, before every, we can stay a little bit longer if people want to see a, a more in-depth demo of Node Red. Um, uh, Ryan and Cam can, can demo what they have. Uh, but I'd be curious uh, to know um, what, after hearing this, what do you need? Do you need more information? Um, uh, what, what are you interested in doing? Do you want to, you know, uh, I, I want to really, really stress that this does not all have to be technical contributions. We, I, I would like to see this be uh, um, a community-based project, not just open source technology, but, but open source product, open product development. So requirements generation, uh, specification generation, uh, functional design, specs, um, uh, QA, uh, uh, product vision. I mean, there's, there's a whole series of work that happens before code gets written. And, and, and so um, uh, documentation. So I, I'd like to, to know if, if, you know, what, what you need to engage with us with, with the expertise that you have or that you'd want to provide um, to this uh, uh, growing community. This is Matt. Um, hi. Um, I think for me, it's, it's some of that, what you talked about earlier, Jeff, which is what are the problems we were trying to solve? Some, some elevator speech points that's talked to really the type of products that could come out of an effort like this. So for example, you know, uh, you need a research administration view. They, there's certain intelligence that they're trying to gather. How can share help with that? There is the actual researcher view in the sense of, I want to find collaborators or sources of information that I can work with. And then of course the consumers of research that are like, when I think of the original share dashboard, which is I'm looking for articles on X, Y, and Z or preprint, et cetera. And then those integration points. So being able to sort of like, elevate that to a point where we can actually talk about deliverables that when we're looking at our community, how can we explain this to them that gets them to buy into it? Um, and, and, and again, some of that is that customization point that you also talked about too, which is if we're feeding into this, the ability to manage that, but then also what can we take out of it and maybe make more interoperable with like, I think Rick alluded to our internal discovery systems and things like that. So I know that's a lot. But um, just having some talking points, I think, around this um, is very helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would like, I, th I think, in that spirit of not doing a if you build it, they will come sort of thing, really uh, also on, on the sort of flipping that around and, and asking, uh, 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 you know, restate some of those things with uh, with your institution's interests in mind. What are the things 
that you need with respect to uh, research information management? What are the uh, what are the data sources that you've been wanting to um, combine in certain ways to deal with those local problems? And so if we can sort of do both of those things, we can certainly generate ideas for how this data can be used, um, but there's so many of them. And, and really what we're trying to achieve is what problem do you want to solve tomorrow? Like literally tomorrow, what can we build or maybe next week or two weeks, uh, not in a year, like right now, what do, what do you want to build? What do you have resources? What do you have passion? Uh, what do you have expertise in building to solve those problems locally? So I think it's that we, we can create those, those bullet points, but I want to hear that with reference to a given institution. I think that might be more meaningful to other institutions when they hear, okay, it's not just we're building this, this thing that sounds like a, a rim system or, you know, the harvesting for a rim system, but um, uh, uh, Notre Dame wants to build this, this piece to, to engage with their current uh, research information management system to solve this problem for users. Yeah, and so those known use cases would be great because we could hear that, that would percolate ideas from our end too and think, oh, okay, we had this problem over here that we didn't even think could be Sure, yep, related. exactly. Yep, that's right, that's good. Others, what, what do you need from us as far as the next type of calls or, or more information? Uh, for those people that are new to share, this was probably a whirlwind uh, of, of what's, what's going on with SHARE. So what do you need from us to, to sort of engage uh, in, in some of these, these processes? Hi, oh, Jeff, this is, this is SHARE. I just have a question. If, if this is SHARE V3, then what's the current state of the SHARE V2 that you can search now? And, and is that still being harvested from things or what's that state? If you can update us on that. Yeah, so as Rick mentioned, uh, uh, it's, it's data still being gathered um, uh, uh, and made available uh, for, uh, uh, I think, public consumption. Um, uh, I left COS back in, in March, and so I don't know the latest thinking on, on but that product or, or service, but, um, I, I, I think data, as far as I know, data is continue to be gathered and, and pre, for example, preprint search is still, I, I think it's still the only or one of the only aggregate searches available um, is made available via OSF preprints, which is built right on top of Share V2. So um, uh, I, ex I expect that, I hope that that, that remains uh, available. Um, uh, but then as, as we work on these more decentralized pieces, uh, others like Notre Dame and Virginia Tech may be willing to grab chunks of that data and host it themselves. Um, uh, but I guess for the time being, as far as I, I know, that uh, the plan is to, to keep harvesting data. But yeah, certainly the, 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 a, a big part of that is as we're building up this new form of infrastructure is to migrate the majority of the activity to that. Yeah, we reduce CUS's burden with, with that, with, in, in, with in, in that respect, and so um, uh, uh, that that is that is one of the uh, potential outcomes of that uh, uh, decentralization. Okay, so I started adding an action items list to the notes here as well, um, and definitely if something was said, and, and it's probably something that is missing still, please add to the list. Uh, Okay, so if folks have, you know, five or 10 minutes, maybe we could get a quick demo of some of the more uh, sophisticated detailed things that, uh, that Cam, you could, you, could, you could show. Yeah. And, and I if, will if stop any, sharing here. And if there's anything else that, that you want to uh, ask or say, you can go ahead and leave it in that community call document. There's a section at the bottom uh, and we can follow up uh, asynchronously. Uh, uh, we, we do want this to be a across the board, a community effort. Okay, so uh, this is Cam here, and I just wanted to give you guys a quick tour of what the API looks like right now. Uh, so this is a collection of, of works from various sources, and I know it's kind of hard to see, but there are multiple entries here with various levels of detail. This one obviously has nothing in it, uh, but here you have a preprint without a DOI, for example, from the archive. And so the neat thing about the API that I built out 
is that it can take uh, non-normalized data and normalize it for you. So here is, on this side, is what an archive uh, like payload looks like. If you just scrape their site, convert it to JSON, it looks like this. And you can see that, well, you can see that when you uh, post it to this API, it actually scrapes out the relevant information. So it gives you a published date, it gives you the title, the abstract, and then it also holds on to all the original information. So we can, uh, you know, scrape that and deal with that in the future if we want to. And this also works for Crossref. Again, you have this standard Crossref, uh, you know, body. And if you submit that, you get a Crossref result. Uh, again, normalized to the database. And you can also submit pre-normalized data. So this is just some example of maybe what might appear if you decide to do the mapping in the uh, node bed flow itself. So, sorry. There we go. So you can see that it includes all the relevant information. And the benefit of this is that it adds some redundancy. So for sources that people don't have mappings for or are not able to make their own mappings, we can handle that on the back end. Uh, and if we end up deciding to use a different technology besides the way, which I don't think is the case, uh, it still gives us that flexibility. Also, this API layer currently interacts with Postgres, which is a relational database. That doesn't have to be the case for this to work. This can accept, or this can, uh, you know, put data into any sort of, any sort of pot, any sort of decentralized or centralized database. And that's, that's most of what I have, just this idea of being able to scrape from any source and just submit the raw information and then normalize that. The final thing I want to mention is that, well, two things. One, Elastic is very simple to add on top of this. And two, that mappings could be made by users and stored in a database and then pulled out when they see the relevant URLs. So if it sees, uh, I don't know, a bio archive, it can grab the data or somebody can write a uh, mapping that takes the data from bioarchive and turns it into this normalized format. And then whenever in the future someone submits raw data from bioarchive, it can be adapted to this format automatically. And that's basically everything I have right now. Okay, thanks, thanks, Cam. I think this traits is, is how quickly, and Cam put this together quite quickly, how quickly we can um, uh, solve how quickly we can we can create techniques to solve different challenges so here we've never really thought about um, uh, surfacing a, a normalized uh, uh, database or an API to a normalized database um, uh, as, as the main asset for, for a, a service uh, if we have this local concern uh, uh, it's very easy to take the data that comes out of those harvested nodes and map them into the to a model um, uh, that we would need, uh, say, to be normalized to, to, to solve whatever problem that we're, we're trying to solve. Um, so we can we can we can do that very quickly. We can put into a full sec text search uh, uh, database very quickly, uh, which is sort of current, how current Shaver T V two is is mainly used. Um, we can leave it as those those raw key values like like Cam showed. Um, is that is that does that seem accurate uh, in terms of how easy it is to work with when we when we have a this this uh, less uh, specified approach, Cam? Yeah, it does. And to to reiterate on how quick this was, it took about uh, maybe three or four hours worth of work to set this entire thing up. Uh, and transporting parts of this already made would be even easier to other projects. Okay. Good. Very good. Okay, and I know we're over time. Um, so I don't want to push it too too far in that regard. But just to say quickly that, you know, like a lot of these things that what the example that Cam just gave, uh, really thinking that that would be the kind of tool or component that would be able to be called from a flow, for example, and and all of the things that I like the very simple example that I showed, there is the ability within node red to wrap all that up as just one node in that flow. So like as we continue to develop these 
uh, common flows, ones that are going to be consistent in many ways. If the only thing that's changing is where you point it to, you know, which OEI PAMH source you harvest from, we don't expect everyone to, to then be expected to write an OEI PAMH flow that would do all of the logic that would handle pulling the data from that. So, so the, those are the kind of things that we're really looking to build out templates and component and reusable things that, that can then just be, make it that much easier to bowl from. So, so then it really is just a matter of working with the differences in the metadata and the, the kind of inputs and outputs that come out of these things. And, but the, the actual plumbing, you know, that we found that that does not need to change dramatically. And there's, there's kind of a, there, there, there's, there's for the most part, a smaller number of types of sources that we would that we would pull from. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. So, so people like Cam uh, uh, like building these uh, sorts of systems that that automatically take embedded and nested data and, and normalize them, uh, 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 so that you can use SQL or you know use uh, you know R to use SQL to access or or, or whatnot. Um, but that could be you just want to, to do all of that could be literally one function in node red that you say I want cross ref and archive and bio archive uh, uh, to go into this system normalize it and then I want to be able to access use use R to access that data that can all be wrapped up in these in these very visual sorts of ways using the, this this interface that we're, we're starting with as far as uh, how you put together these flows. Okay, so any last questions. Uh, th this is Jubal, a quick question. Uh, so th this looks very promising, uh, but I wonder, in order for us to share uh, this type of modules, uh, do we need to define an output format? Otherwise, it's, it sounds like you would have multiple in, multiple out, uh, different types of uh, format of for input and output. Then it's, it becomes harder to share because it's end-to-end -end, uh, relation. If you can put something like uh, n to one or n to two or n to three, a defined set of output format, uh, then this model would be much easier to share, but then it could be a little bit restriction. I, I wonder, uh, do we want to strike a balance or we just let people do whatever they want? That's a, that's a great question uh, uh, and, a, and a critical one. So uh, the thinking right now, and Rick can comment on this as well, is uh, uh, that we would, uh, there would be two places that we try to define some schema. And you don't have to use that schema. We don't have to have a community-based standard. There, nothing needs to be developed there. It's better if there is. Uh, and we can, you know, uh, as, as sub-communities come together to solve problems, we can, we can find those. But one, we need to basically say, this is what that API, what, what that, uh, that source provides what is the data they provide and even that can change we need some way to validate that if you change your date to mean not just the date published but the date that you got the data we need to know that uh, uh, just as well as if you change date to uh, to a capital D rather than a lowercase d uh, so we have some input schema that we that we uh, uh, write against that we validate against and that's that's an easier one. That one is, and shouldn't be too hard for the community to agree with because it's mostly just mapping fields to uh, this this validation format, which is a you know standard. We're thinking right now about the JSON schema, which is easy to write and easy to, to use. Um, I, someone could develop one in XML uh, if they want to. Um, I, now on the on the how how do you do that across multiple sources? This is this. Uh, ontology alignment phase that we're thinking about uh, this, this ability to map because because we have some standard ways to talk about the data coming in and we know the type of data because it's typed it, it says this is a string or this is a date this is a date that obeys ISO you know, XYZ um, I, we can we can use sort of techniques from ontology alignment to map that data into an aggregate source uh, and then someone could provide that source using that schema if they want to. But where we focus our efforts is, is really defining how that's mapped. Uh, uh, and then if a community wants to come together and say they, oh, they really like data site, they want to use the data site schema, or they, they like the share V2 schema, uh, we can just create that mapping to that. And then if people use it, great. If, if they want to change it, all they do is change that mapping. And it's very then low effort to then pump that right back through, for example, CAM's auto normalization system to create the database they need on, on their backup. 
Yep, thank you. Okay, so let, I think it's probably good to wrap this up now. So the so again, uh, looking if you have the agenda open, so so that I really think really the next step is to schedule the next call here, and we'll have that out in the next few days. But really looking to have that be within four weeks. Uh, I think as as we really become active, I can see this becoming at least biweekly, uh, and and you know that. Again, you know, less overview, more granular detail of of current tasks is what I would uh, expect that to be, and then we can, as we go, continue to decide. You know, should we have different types of calls, et cetera, to make sure we can communicate and discuss all the various levels of of detail there. But but this is I very very much appreciate everyone joining today. It's been, I think it's been a fantastic discussion and, and really a, a great start and as we really pull more and more groups uh, actively into this. All right, thank you. Well, I will go ahead and stop the recording. Again, thank you all and please keep in touch. And, and I think uh, if you want to, if you're really uh, excited to contribute now. The getting on the Discord channel is the quickest way to connect. Sending an email to myself, uh, Jeff, Judy, anyone uh, within that space. But I think um, like my email is just rick.johnson at nd.edu. So very, very simple, easy, easy to remember. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.